Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and happy new month. Thank you for joining us, both to our virtual audience and incredibly an in-person audience. It just feels wonderful to see all of you here. To get started, I'm going to turn the mic over to knowledge keeper Pauline Shirt to start us off today. Um, I'll now turn it over to Bruce and Ina to take us through the rest of our afternoon. Great. Thanks, Charmaine, and thanks, Knowledge Keeper Pauline, for your presence and your, your wise words and your blessing. Uh, we've received it with, uh, with gratitude. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm Bruce Ryder, by the way. I'm a member of the faculty at Osgoode Hall Law School, and um, the academic director of the Anti-Discrimination Intensive Program and uh, the director of clinical legal education at, at the law school. And I want to welcome you all to the symposium from classroom to case law. It's wonderful to have you all here in this room and to have many others joining us uh, virtually. We're delighted to be here today to uh, honor and celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Human Rights Code never forgetting, I hope, the struggles to achieve its enactment and development over the years, uh, bearing in mind it's the overriding commitment the code reflects in law and in public policy to the achievement of a society free of barriers to full and equal participation in the key social areas the code addresses. We are proud of the contributions the code has made to the identification and transformation of practices of social exclusion and subordination. These successes inspire us to meet the constantly evolving challenges we face in achieving the goals of the code. Today's symposium is also a celebration of the Anti-Discrimination Intensive Program a full semester experiential education program launched in 2011 as a partnership between Osgoode Hall Law School and the Human Rights Legal Support Center, and through which students at Osgoode spend an entire semester at the Human Rights Legal Support Center working with the staff and lawyers in providing legal advice and assistance to applicants under the code at all stages of the processing of those applications from first contact on intake through to mediation and adjudications. The program has benefited from the extraordinary support we've been provided to by Osgood, by Dean Lauren Sawson, now Justice Sawson, and Dean Mary Condon, who is present here in the room, and by the executive directors at the Human Rights Legal Support Center, uh, Kathy Laird, who is also here, and Charmaine Hall, who was at my side and is in the room. Um, the support of the Center and of Osgood, of course, has been crucial to the success of the program. Clinical and, edu and intensive programs at Osgood are situated at the intersection of theory and practice and uh, often depend on their success on a strong partner organization. The Center has been a dream partner since 2011 and I expect will be for many years to come. Over 130 students have participated in the anti-discrimination intensive program, now in its 12th year. We are pleased to have many of the current students and former students uh, joining us today, and several will be speaking on the panels this afternoon. Students in ADIP, as we call it, uh, receive tremendous training, mentoring, and skills development from the lawyers and the staff at the center, while at the same time providing invaluable assistance to the center uh, in, in, in meeting the need for legal advice and support to applicants to the tribunal, thus promoting access to justice and the development of tribunal jurisprudence. <laughs> ADIP alumni 
are now working in various locations and rules in the legal profession across Ontario and indeed across the continent, from San Francisco to New York, from Vancouver to Halifax. ADIP alums frequently report that their experience working at the center has been formative to their professional careers and to their human rights informed practices. Through their research papers, which they complete as part of the program, many of which have been published, ADIP students are also making valuable contributions to scholarship on the code and our knowledge of the achievements and challenges faced by Ontario's unique three pillar human rights system. So I'm very excited about the two panels that will be taking place this afternoon and our opportunity to engage with the panelists and with each other in celebrating these important achievements and also discussing the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Knowledge Keeper and Great Grandmother Pauline, for your blessing and for sending us on this journey with positive vibrations. You have filled the air with inspiring feelings, and I know you're inspire, uh, you will be inspiring for our speakers and our audience. So, uh, Miigwech on behalf of all of us, and Miigwech to you, Professor Ryder, for these uh, kind opening remarks and really informative telling people about the ADIP uh, program. I'm speaking on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Human Rights Legal Support Center. So allow me to say namaskar. Welcome to all of our friends online and our friends here and present. We look forward to discussing 60 years of the fight against discrimination and intolerance, and importantly, showcasing the vital role that the Human Rights Legal Support Center and our ADIP play in this province in, propo in promoting and uh, protecting human rights. A special welcome, Dean Condon. A special welcome uh, to our original executive director, Kathy Laird. And a special welcome to inaugural chair, Rajanand. There are many others I know that are watching, so please, uh, please know that we're very grateful for all your support. In due course, I promise a proper introduction to our fantastic moderators, Lisa Sorello, CEO of the Law Foundation of Ontario and Ontario Superior Court Justice Andrew Pinto. But first, let me tell you, it's essential that I must say a proper thank you to the hardworking HRLSC staff who have toiled tirelessly on a shoestring budget to make this symposium come to life. The team consisted primarily of one administrative staff member, Sharon Hughes, our only and single communications coordinator, Andrew Ursel, and a, a lovely temp part-time student who's joined us, Julene. For the past few months, these three individuals have juggled their regular duties as well as extended hours on this symposium from the side of their desk. So thank you to the team. What I say is that this successful launch of this program and the, how we have come together speaks to the strength of our center's conviction, our conviction in the service that we do for all Ontarians and our dedication to you ADIP students. We're, for almost 15 years, the center has been at the front lines of offering trauma-informed, accessible, prompt, innovative legal services that are responsive to the needs of diverse communities in every corner of the province. We're a small and mighty center, and we're special. We're special not only because we provide tangible support and access to justice by answering approximately 24,000 calls a year. We're not just special because we produce tangible human rights results by mediating and litigating hundreds upon hundreds of applications per annum, always with the view of securing the best public interest for the province. But also we're special because we sponsor a tangible long-term human rights benefit of mentoring annually a new cohort of socially justice-minded students who infuse the province, and now I've come to understand, infuse North America with their human rights knowledge and experience that they've gained from um, their special mentors at the center. ADIP is part of our suite of real life, 
real-time services to bringing conflict resolution and redress for Ontarians. Let me highlight another important legal service birthed by the Centre. We have a dedicated Indigenous services and outreach team that supports Indigenous peoples and fosters trusting relationships with Indigenous communities across the province, offering a variety of Indigenous languages and culturally safe services. We assist with specific needs of Indigenous clients to advance their human rights claims. Let me pause. I confess, when I reflect upon how much the Human Rights Legal Support Centre has accomplished since the days of Kathy and Raj, and how many high-caliber human rights advocates we've launched, I feel pride, I feel, I feel sentimental. So I can't even imagine what Raj and, and Kathy feel today seeing us. But I also lament, and I know all of you lament, because the needs for our legal services have not decreased. Rather, Racism, transphobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and other bigotry and hate is, is on the rise. Disability discrimination and segregation are chronic, chronic problems. Headlines confirm that sexual harassment has not abated, and in fact, some of those in the most powerful positions continue to perpetrate it in the name of many Canadian so-called values. So, as we celebrate, we must reaffirm our human rights values and look to our supporters to strengthen and invest in the HRLSE services. I also want to share a message to the students. Just think, where were we in the human rights landscape in 2007 when the center was coming into being? Back then, we didn't have gender identity protection in the code. Back then, very few had picked up on the phrase of Me Too. Police services were actively carding and continuing to deny the existence of systemic racism. And even the old code had a cap on general damages, believe it or not. <laughs> so this is how far we've come. But it's the center that has been the key player in these watershed moments of the advancement of quality rights in the province. And we have given everyone from the most ordinary to the most marginalized citizen of this province a safe place and a platform to be able to pursue their human rights. Now, ADEP students, you are the next keepers of our prestigious human rights legacy. Always be guided by the words proclaimed in the code of the inherent dignity of every person. Safeguard the inalienable rights proclaimed in our preamble. Remember the courage of the complainants and applicants of the past who spoke their truth to have their rights respected. And never, ever waver to hold those accountable to our province's pledge to protect human rights for everyone and everywhere in Ontario. It is with the greatest pleasure and privilege I am delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Kim Murray, who has devoted her career to this mission of human rights and truth and reconciliation. You have Kim's illustrious bio in your program in front of you, so I'll only touch on a few points to uh, highlight her extraordinary perspective. You all know that in June, Kim was appointed as the independent special interlocutor for missing children and unmarked graves and burial sites associated with the Indian residential schools. Prior to that, Kim was the province's first ever assistant deputy attorney general for indigenous justice, leading the revitalization of indigenous laws. And then prior to that, Kim was executive director of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, advocating for the voices of survivors of the Canadian Indian residential school system. From 95 to 2010, Kim was a staff lawyer and then executive director of Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. And I can attest to her talents as a litigator, as Kim appeared before me in an Aboriginal uh, racial profiling case. And I learned so much from you, Kim, and your counsel when you presented your successful arguments. Kind of wish you hadn't settled. <laughs> Just Kim is the recipient of numerous accolades. 
However, I think the honor she wears most proudly is mum of two special daughters who shine her family's human rights torch as they chart their own path as young, strong Indigenous women. Kim, welcome. Heartful gratitude to you and your family for doing our work. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't know that was coming. <laughs> um, so, Sego, Seguego, Skinagoaga, Kimberly Murray, Yungat, Skanyagahaga, Ni'i, Neganasatage, Wakwaho. Um, I want to first acknowledge that we are in the Dish with One Spoon Treaty territory and that Toronto has been and continues to be the home of many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, I want to also uh, say miigwech and nawe to uh, knowledge holder, keeper, great light in my life, Pauline, <laughs> uh, for your words and guidance th in this uh, opening, uh, this dialogue today. It is of great importance that we start off in this way so that we can bring our minds together as one. Um, the Rodoshoni Ohande Gary Watgetwe is our Thanksgiving address, which is what we say before we do anything important. Our greetings to all creation, as Pauline spoke about. In the Thanksgiving, we give thanks to the, the people first, and then we give thanks to our enlightened teachers. And I'm so thankful and grateful to the teachings that Pauline, that you, Pauline, have given me over my life, and I'm so happy that you are able to be here today with us while we have this conversation. So miigwech to you and for everything that you've done for our people in the province of Ontario and the city of Toronto. Well, I love you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to also acknowledge survivors as Pauline identified that she's a survivor. I want to acknowledge survivors and the families of survivors that are possibly here in this room with us today, and to survivors and family members of survivors that are watching online. No one has, a, has faced the atrocities and the breaches of your human rights like you have. And I hold you up and I hold you in my heart every day in the work that I do. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, there's so many. I won't name them all. <laughs> it's so wonderful uh, to be here. And, um, and say thank you to Ina for introducing me. And um, I remember that case very well. And I thought, boy, I'm so lucky to have Ina as the adjudicator on this <laughs> racial profiling case that we did many, many years ago. And I, I thank you for that. And um, I, I'm just grateful for the opportunity as a lawyer at Aboriginal Legal Services to contribute to some human rights case law um, as this conference is talking about case law. Um, so, my understanding of today's gathering is that it's meant to be a time of celebration, as Pauline said. A celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Human Rights Code and the work of the Human Rights Legal Support Center and Osgood's Anti-Discrimination Intensive Program. Didn't exist when I was at Osgood. I'm glad <laughs> it's there now. It is also meant to be a time of reflection. Reflection is an important teaching that the elders often speak of. We are taught that we have to understand where we have come from before we can know where we need to go. And so I will start my reflecting, I will start by reflecting on human rights for Indigenous people in Ontario over the last 60 years and how the systems, for the most part, have failed Indigenous people. I know that as human rights practitioners, it's not easy to hear that. The TRC wrote extensively about how Indigenous peoples' human rights have been breached by the state in the areas of education, justice, health care, and child well-being. These breaches are all identified and discussed in the legacy volume of the Truth and Reconciliation Final Report. I know that many of you here today and watching our, online are fully aware of the past and current abuses. The TRC commissioner said that no Canadian can take pride in the country's treatment of Indigenous people. And for this reason, all Canadians have a critical role in advancing reconciliation in ways that honour, 
and revitalize the nation-to-nation -nation treaty relationship. Developing respect for and an understanding of the situations of others is an important but often ignored part of the reconciliation process. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission highlighted that 7,000 survivors highlighted that the 7,000 survivors' testimonies that they gathered compelled those who listened to think deeply about justice and what it really means in the face of mass human rights violations. They also said that teaching and learning about this history can be difficult because it can bring up feelings of anger, grief, shame, guilt, and denial. But it can also shift understanding and alter worldviews. The TRC found that there was an urgent need in Canada to develop historically literate citizens who understand why and how the past is relevant to their own lives and the future of the country. Part of this historical literacy that human rights practitioners need to have today is the understanding that for Indigenous people, the systems put in place to protect human rights seemingly were only put in place to protect the human rights of settlers. Residential schools is an important case study in this regard. Here are some facts. The Canadian Bill of Rights Act was enacted in 1960. The first Human Rights Code in Ontario was enacted in 1962. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association was founded in 1964. And the legal aid clinics in Ontario were established in the early 1970s. Some more facts. The longest operating Indian residential school was right here in Ontario. The Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Ontario, just down the road from Toronto. It opened its doors in 1828 and didn't shut down until 1971. 17, 17 other Indian residential schools operated in the province of Ontario. The last school to close in this province was in 1991. Children, stolen from their parents and their communities, locked in these places where their language and culture were beat out of them. Little children, physically, sexually, spiritually, and emotionally abused. Many died, and their bodies were never returned home. Many are buried in unmarked graves right here in Ontario, yet to be found. Now, I did some math. Let's do the math. The last school, Indian Residential School, closed in Ontario in 1991. That means for 31 years, the Canadian Bill of Rights Act was in operation. 29 years after the Ontario Human Rights Code was enacted, this is the last school closed in Ontario. 27 years after the Canadian Civil Liberties Association was founded and 20 years after legal aid clinics were opened in this province. And so I ask you, where was everybody? Where was everybody? Did these children not matter? Phil Fontaine, the former national chief and an Indian residential school survivor, one of the first to publicly speak of the human rights abuses that occurred, is quoted in the TRC report. And he said, Reconciliation must mean real change for all of our people in all the places we choose to live, change that addresses the wrongs in a way that brings us all closer together. Human rights, hope, opportunity, and human flourishing are not the privilege of one group or one segment of Canadian society. They belong to all of us. The truth is, the systems and organizations created to protect human rights have, for far too long, privileged only some. So some of you here 
today might be thinking, well, residential schools were under the federal government. So there's nothing that Ontario human rights systems and the code could do to stop these harms. And I want to challenge those that might be thinking that right now. First, the history of the Indian residential schools and their interconnectedness with other systems, including provincial systems, is becoming more known as records are uncovered. Children were taken to Indian residential schools, traded to the provincial reformatories, locked up in provincial sanatoria and hospitals, experimented on with many universities leading this work. The justice system failed them, the healthcare system failed them, and the childcare system failed them. There is plenty of provincial responsibility and wrongdoing. There was a lot that human rights advocates and organizations could have been doing to expose and stop these abuses. Some tried, and the TRC writes about those warriors that tried, but they were on their own and didn't have anyone to work with to help them expose these abuses. I also want to point out that the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry spoke about interjurisdictional neglect that Indigenous people face. This finger pointing, it's not us, it's them. And because it's not us, we can just be bystanders and watch the human rights abuses happen. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this country. And in order for that to happen, there has to be awareness of the past, acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for the causes, and action to change behavior. Entities like those I mentioned today need to become aware of and acknowledge their failure in fighting for and protecting the human rights of Indigenous people. Once they reflect on their failures, then they have an ethical responsibility to foster reconciliation today that is rooted in justice. They need to take action and not be the bystanders of the past. Recently, I was speaking at a gathering in Winnipeg and I shared some words of an elder that is quoted in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Nishnabe elder Mary Deliri emphasized that the work of reconciliation must continue in ways that honor the ancestors, respect the land, and rebalance relationships. She said, and I quote, I'm going to quote her, even through all the struggles <coughs> even through all what has been disrupted, we can still hear the voice of the land. We can hear the care and the love of the children. We can hear about our law. We can hear about our stories, our governance, our feasts, and our medicines. We have work to do. The land is made up of the dust of our ancestors' bones. And so to reconcile with this land and everything that has happened, there is much work to be done in order to create balance. And so how do we create balance? And this is where I move from reflection to celebration. Although the human rights systems of the past have failed Indigenous people, progress has been made. We have new structures, and processes in place that try and create the balance that Elder Deliri references. And so what do I mean? I remember being a young lawyer at Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. I started working there in 1995, my first job as a lawyer. I worked there for 15 years. During that time, I filed many, 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 many <laughs> human rights complaints. The old system did not work for Indigenous claimants. All our efforts were focused on trying to convince the Commission why the claim should proceed. AL, Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto welcomed the changes in the system that Bill 107 brought into force in 2008. 
removing the gatekeeper function of the commission, allowing people to file complaints directly to the tribunal, refocusing the role of the commission to systemic discrimination issues in education, and creating the Human Rights Legal Support Center were all seen as important changes. At this time of change, Aboriginal Legal Services advocated for all, that all three bodies needed to create dedicated access points, services, and processes for Indigenous people and communities. And I know, how mu I know much has been done in this regard since 2008. When I think of the three pillars of the system in Ontario today, we have come a long way. And we should be proud. I was reflecting on what teachings I could bring to this conversation today. And I think that we can learn from the three sisters. I know many of you have heard and tasted three sister soup, which consists of corn, beans, and squash. The teachings come from the, the corn, beans, and the squash, and not from the soup. They share space and are interplanted. The three crops protect and nurture each other when they are planted together. First, we plant the corn, then the bean seeds, both in the same area. The beans contribute to the soil and the corn stalks serve as poles for the beans to grow. At the same time, the squash is planted so that the leaves of the squash can shade the ground to preserve moisture and prevent weed growth. The three plants thrive better when they're together than when they are planted alone. I think that the three pillars of the human rights system in Ontario, the tribunal, the commission, and the support center are like the three sisters. They thrive together, support one another, and encourage each other's growth. So, I know you're all asking, which is the corn? <laughs> <laughs> which are the beans? <laughs> and who are the squash? I think we could have a whole panel on that. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it to each of you in your own minds to determine which is which. So moving forward, I want to challenge each of the three pillars of the human rights system to review the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 10 principles of reconciliation and ask these questions as you do. First, have you incorporated the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People into your processes? Secondly, how are you supporting First Nations, First, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples as they fight for their treaty, constitutional, and human rights to be recognized? Third, the TRC said reconciliation is a process of healing relationships and requires public truth sharing, apology, and commemoration that acknowledges the redress and redress of the past. Have you done this as an entity? Have you apologized and acknowledged your previous failures? The TRC said that action is required to address the ongoing legacy of colonialism that have had destructive impacts on Indigenous people's education, culture, language, health, child welfare, justice, and economic opportunities and prosperity. What action are you taking as entities in all of these areas? The TRC said that a more equitable and inclusive society needs to be created by closing the gaps in social health and economic outcome outcomes. How are you helping to close those gaps? All Canadians share responsibility for establishing and maintaining mutually respectful relationships. What have you done personally, professionally, and as institutions to enhance respectful relationships. There's the perspectives and understandings of Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers are vital to long-term reconciliation. How do you work with elders and knowledge keepers? Are you making space for their perspective in the work that you are doing? 
supporting Indigenous people's revitalization of their laws, protocols, and connections to the land are essential. Are these protocols and laws part of your work, part of your systems and processes? Reconciliation requires political will, joint leadership, trust building, accountability, and transpar transparency, and a substantial investment of resources. Where have you directed your resources in the work that you do? And finally, reconciliation requires sustained public education and dialogue about the history and legacy of residential schools, treaties, and indigenous rights. What does your public education program look like? Was it created by and with indigenous peoples? Who is delivering those programs for you and how? So I want to close with sharing a short seven minute video that was made by the Survivor Secretariat. The Survivor Secretary is a survivor-led organization created to find the unmarked burials at the Mohawk Institute that I spoke about. I had the great honor of working with the survivors there for approximately one year, right after Takim Loops revealed the possible recovery of 215 unmarked graves. This conference today is titled From Classroom to Case Law. And for me, the case law has never come first. I know lawyers don't like to hear that. The case <laughs> law has never come first. The Onkwe Honwe, the people, they need to always be front and center. And so I want to share the survivor's words with you as I close my comments today. I'm gonna to look at my friend at the back there. <laughs> It was hell on earth. Just no love, no nurturing here. Trying to, you know, break my spirit. I was sent to the Mohawk Institute when I was six years old in 1957. I was 10 years old when I left in 1961. I would say that was probably one of the saddest times in my life was being a kid here at the Mohawk Institute at the Mush Hall. Because I didn't have anybody that loved me the way that a mother would love you. There's just no love, no nurturing here. And, and I think that's one of the more devastating um, experiences, not only for me, but for most kids. They had no one here that loved them. So you're just kind of on your own, and uh, you learn like what's good and bad. Like you know, like your mom when you was a kid, they always tell you, you know, that they uh, when you grew up, they 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 were the teachers, <laughs> like to teach you right from wrong and stuff, and you know, and understand like uh, commitments or get courage or whatever stuff like that all means something. But you don't get that stuff here. You just gotta learn that after you leave. I I come here when I was six years old. We worked all the time. They used the kids for slave labor. I got hit in the eye with a stone, but it was never looked after. They never checked it out. They just wouldn't take your word for it. That's why I only got one eye. It was hell on earth. Well, like the five years I was here, I ran away between 25 and 30 times. And it, it, was, it didn't matter whether you came back by yourself or they caught you. Well, this was where they put me a few times for running away, but I wasn't the only one. But my bed is gone from on the floor here. There used to be a two by 12 and a slop pail from my toilet. I got to get 
I didn't want to be in there too long. Me and my brother went down the hall and uh, they cut all our hair off. I guess that was the process, that, you know, like uh, part of the assimilation policies. So at this school, we basically run everything by numbers. Geronimo, your number's going to be 48. We ain't got time to, like, uh, call you by your real names. Well, one of the things that affected me is at home, Mohawk was spoke in the house all the time, you know. And here he got by the sluts up so many times inside the head for speaking it. I just, I just didn't want to speak it. At one time, probably late 1800s or so, it was a steady diet of mush. They were getting mush many times a day, maybe two or three times a day. So yeah, that's the mush hole. And you know, we didn't like the mush either. A lot of times it would have been slimy, maybe worms. And they had a big farm here. Well, I mean, as we're finding out now, there's about 600 acres. It's like a thousand chickens, 30 milking cows, and like 40 pigs here all the time. So there's no reason why we should be hungry. We weren't free to walk in that orchard. You weren't free to pick up any of those apples on the ground. It's just, to me, it's a crime in itself. You know, what was, what was wrong with picking up a windfall that was already off the tree? It just goes to show you how cruel this place was to not allow a child to at least go out in the orchard. Why couldn't we take an apple without being punished? You know, th those are the things that I find a lot of injustice here and cruelty. Well, there's a laneway that goes down along the side of here. You go out down, down there and you go over to the orchard. Steal a bunch of apples and they weren't really that good anyway, but we would get them with something to eat. The apples were, to me, they're really significant, especially mush hole guys. They knew the significance. They knew what it was like not to be able to take those apples or you had to do it through stealth and you know, and they're saying that you're committing some kind of a crime like theft. We weren't. Even though uh, this place could really dampen your spirits, you know, it was a cruel place, we still found a way to get past that and even if it's just a small piece, a little apple, I think that's, uh, that's kind of like justice. <laughs> I want to get the word out, and all I want uh, out of everything is to get justice from these, uh, for residential school survivors. And there's a lot of them that can't talk about it today, you know, and I'm kind of like, uh, I'm just kind of like, I'm, I'm speaking for them. Sakwizalo, you persevere. Got Nicoleo. Good mind. Thoughtful. Go on an hour's soft caring words. Scona. Peacefulness. Dosa. De un dakal de galewa de. Do not hurt anyone. sharing that film. Thank you for opening our eyes and reminding us of our ethical responsibility and most importantly for challenging us to step out of our comfort zone as bystanders. And we, I hope we take up that mantle and we do you proud, Kim. I, I do want to say I feel real remiss that I didn't, uh, in my opening remarks, uh, introducing the supporters here include uh, my friend and mentor, Michael Gottile, one of the originators of our three pillar system as well. So thank you, Michael. And so subsequently notice that we have some of our three pillar partners here in attendance. Hi, Jean. Hi, Raj. Welcome. 
Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll move to our experiential education panel, if that's okay. Yeah. So what I will do, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I will invite the experiential uh, education panelists to join us. And while we're doing the musical chairs dance, I'm going to introduce Lisa Cirillo, our moderator. Our moderator of the experiential education panel is the vibrant and highly respected Lisa Cirillo. Lisa has served as the CEO of the Law Foundation of Ontario since 2020. Prior to that, Lisa was director of downtown legal services, a community-based legal clinic with University of Toronto Law School. And then prior to that, Lisa was counsel with Arch Disability Law and the Ontario Human Rights Commission. I can attest to Lisa's passion, keen sensitivity to inequities and dedication to improving access to justice as I've worked with Lisa as co-counsel. Thank you, Lisa, for jo joining us today and sharing your talents in bringing out the best in the people around you. <laughs> um, for our panelists, Lisa has the oh-so-important <laughs> job of holding up the three, two, one <laughs> time. And I will step back. Uh, thank you, Ina. You really did not need to take time out, especially more time pressed, to introduce me. Mine is just a bit role in the, uh, in the panel discussion this afternoon. But I do want to thank Ina and Bruce for the invitation to come and join this wonderful event. Um, as I said to Ina when she first raised this with me, um, as you just heard, I started my career doing human rights law and I sp have spent 17 of my 22 years, years as a lawyer in experiential education. So the, both, both, of these, uh, both of these pillars really speak to my heart. So uh, I am so honored to introduce this esteemed panel here today. I have been told to keep my introductions to just a few sentences, which will not do them justice. I really encourage you to look at the full program materials uh, and read all about the amazing work uh, that this panel has done, because um, I'm going to not do it justice in my very brief intros. Nonetheless, uh, I am a rule follower, so here we go. Short <laughs> intros for our panel. Um, I'm going to start uh, with Professor Sonia Lawrence. Uh, who's in the middle of our table here. Uh, Professor Lawrence has been a member of Osgood's faculty since 2001. Her work centers on the critical analysis of the legal conception of equality. Over the course of her career, Professor Lawrence has held numerous ser uh, service positions at Osgood and York, far too many to name in the short time that I have today, but some that I will pull out that seem particularly relevant for the conversations we're having today. Professor Lawrence has served as a board member of Parkdale Community Legal Services, as the director of the Institute for Feminist Legal Studies, um, and as academic director of Osgood's anti-discrimination intensive program. Sitting on the far right uh, is our panelist and human rights lawyer, Roger Love. Uh, Roger is a human rights lawyer based in Toronto. Uh, currently counsel to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, Roger previously served as counsel and client service manager for the Ontario, uh, sorry, for the Human Rights Legal Support Centre. Roger has litigated numerous cases regarding anti-black dis uh, anti racism, disability and sexual harassment in the provision of services and employment before the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario and has appeared at many levels of court including the Supreme Court of Canada. Roger is a past mentor and coordinator of Osgood's anti-discrimination intensive program. Uh, sitting to Roger's left is Anya Quadrants. Anya currently is the principal policy advisor at the University of Ottawa Refugee Hub, providing strategic and policy guidance on local, national and global issues affecting refugee rights. Before joining the Refugee Hub, Anya articled at Amnesty International. Uh, engaging in strategic litigation on human rights cases before all levels of courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada, and also engaging in advocacy before the Canadian Parliamentary Committee, as well as United Nations treaty bodies. Anya, for this conversation most notably, is a very proud alum of Osgood's anti-discrimination intensive program. And last but very not least, sitting immediately to my right is Associate Professor Faisal Baba, Faisal, uh, sorry, Professor Baba researches <laughs> and publishes in the areas of constitutional law, multiculturalism, multiculturalism, human rights, and legal ethics. 
in addition to his academic research and teaching, uh, Professor Baba also maintains a small uh, private law practice, advising and representing a variety of individuals and public interest organizations in matters pertaining to constitutional law and human rights. He has appeared before administrative boards and tribunals at all level courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada, and he previously served as Vice Chair of the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. So I know you will join me in welcoming our esteemed panel, and without further ado, are we going in the order on the... Not even sure. I think so. Professor Lawrence, I think you're up first. Yes. Okay. So yeah. on to you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me here today. I'm just asking um, my colleague here to run a timer for me. Oh, I'm do, I, that's my job. Yeah. I'm putting on the stop clock I right now. I need to see it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So um, I just, I'm just going to provide some kind of opening uh, framing, I think, for some of this discussion. So Osgood's anti-discrimination intensive program at the HRLSC was an idea that was brought to fruition by, among many other people, Bruce Ryder and, and Kate Seller in 2010, so two years after the HRLSC had, had first opened its doors. And these two realized that the structure of the center and its mandate made possible a program that could meet two really pressing goals. And really the story of this program is a story about how you meet both of these goals and how you can make these um, work together. So the first is, of course, assisting members of the public in accessing timely and quality legal services in relation to the code. And then the second is a quality clinical legal education opportunity in the area of human rights and administrative law practice. So since that time, as you've heard, more than 120 students have been through the program. Those students clerked or articled, they work as lawyers. They work as crown counsel, they work as defense lawyers, they work at litigators, at large firms, at Bay Street firms, at boutique firms, and in small practice. They work at the Indigenous Legal Branch, they work for the Law Society of Ontario, they work at legal clinics like the Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. They work at the Niagara Community Clinic. They work in immigration law. They work in labor law. They work as human rights consultants. One is working at the Nova Scotia Mass, Ca Mass Casualty Commission that's happening right now. Some are already 10 years into their professional lives as lawyers, and others are not even through their first year of practice. So this large group of students brought their energy and experience to this program. And in return, they were given an excellent experiential learning opportunity. So what I want to focus on here is what is experiential learning and how is it operationalized through this program. And the idea behind experiential learning is to use experience as an instrument for learning, placing emphasis on the process of learning rather than just the content that's being studied. So experiential learning, apparently, um, the intent of experiential learning is to influence the learner in three ways. By altering their cognitive structure of the learner, by modifying the attitude of the learner, and by expanding the repertoire of skills of the learner. So the last one is the one we usually focus on, but I think it's helpful for us to recognize the enormous significance of the other two. So this contemporary understanding of experiential learning is connected to a series of reports that came out in the late 20th and early 21st century, the McCrate Report, the Carnegie Report, and another report that's usually called the Best Practices Report. And all of these came out of the US and all focused on legal um, education and how it could be improved. And so to a certain extent, all of them were talking about moving beyond book learning of doctrine. They spoke about under, developing a sense of professional responsibility. They also placed a heavy emphasis on learning what happens when theory is brought to practice, as Professor Ryder said earlier, or in our context, the learning that happens when we see what law looks like in real life, when it's set free from books, including sometimes that what we see is nothing, nothing happening um, in real life. So the Human Rights Legal Support Center provides the professional context in which this happens, a practice structure in which students can function as beginner professionals, providing services to the public. And the value of this learning experience to students is not merely that they draft agreements or that they engage in mediation or provide summary legal advice. It's that they do this in a supportive learning environment. They're encouraged to ensure both that they have the required background knowledge about the code to provide uh, uh, appropriate service, 
But also, and significantly, and, and this is another word that um, Kim Murray used in her talk, they are encouraged to reflect on what they're doing. So as to be aware of their own learning and learning needs. And so that they develop a deeper understanding of what it is that lawyers are actually doing. So the ADIP program includes an ex intensive set of training sessions put together by the HRLSC, so students get materials and sessions about many of the trickier parts of human rights law, as well as some of the more straightforward parts. I think the trickier parts are like jurisdiction and talking to actual people. Those are the parts that I think are tricky. Um, so how to operate as a legal professional in a clinical environment, but also things like how to use the systems that are used at the HRLSC, how to access precedent documents, all kinds of things that might not ever come up in law school. So the ADIP program also includes a seminar which runs alongside the clinical experience. Students do learn about the history of the code. They're able to explore the development of anti-discrimination law, which is a really fascinating discussion because the development of anti-discrimination law is significantly not a story about lawyers, right? It's a story about social movements. Um, this seminar work can bring together scholarship and theory with students' experiences at the clinic, and we can look at big questions like what is actually driving legal reform, what produces social change, um, and students also use this seminar to do some reflective work, uh, written work on their time at the clinic and um, a major research paper as well. So this whole program absolutely could not exist without the hard work of the lawyer <coughs> mentors who work at the center. Their commitment is just extraordinary. My um, association with this program has been much shorter than Bruce's or Basil's, but um, there were just astonishing uh, amounts of work put in by these lawyer mentors, especially given that it was fall of 2021 when I uh, joined this program, not a great time to be trying to run a clinical program. So I just want to name um, a few people who will have to stand in for all the rest who over the years have served as, as mentors in this program. Emily Shepard, Anna Kalinichenko, Roger Love, um, Keisha Monroe, Lori Mishnevich, Jimima. To, um, to stand in for this much larger group. So this kind of work by lawyers for me is key to creating a sense of connectedness and accountability within the profession, to ensure proper training of newer professionals and to provide a space in which students can explore their professional futures mindfully. And as a law professor, I really can't thank all those folks enough because it can be really complex work to ensure that each student is exposed to the major parts of HRLSC practice. The students don't go there just to fill in gaps in staffing. They don't go there just to do lower level work. They're there to learn through doing. And as such, the doing has to be really carefully curated and supervised. So I'll just um, finish up quickly by saying um, quality experiential education is labor intensive for the provider. It's a deep commitment to the future of the profession. And it's an opportunity for lawyers to pass on their commitment in a, in a, in a in a particular area of law. It's a lot more than just cheerleading or letting people job shadow. Um, it's a space where the academy and the profession can come together across a divide that sometimes um, produces real stereotypes about what goes on in, in either space. And I think it's a real commitment to developing a human rights culture in Ontario. So um, I wanted to tell a story about the fall of 2021, but I'll leave it alone um, <laughs> and I'll give it my time. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Professor Lawrence. And first of all, I just want to say apologies for the back and forth between. We were both your timekeepers, but we had different times. Um, and you're lucky that mine went out. Yes, I am. Time. He gave me very little time. <laughs> and also apologize for the timer going. Clearly, I should not have been trusted with any tech. Um, Otherwise, because, I probably wouldn't have stopped. Yes. So it's okay. good the I'll, I'll try to silence it next time. In any event, also, I'm realizing the order in the program is different than the order in the email. And I don't see Ina, but I'm going to assume we go in the order in the email. Yes, so I think that means, Roger, that you are our next speaker. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm pleased to be here um, in front of, you know, so many of my former colleagues from the um, Human Rights Legal Support Center, um, and even more overjoyed to be here 
uh, in front of some of the former students um, that I think I helped mentor. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, if they got anything uh, out of the experience, um, you know, credit can't only you know be due to myself. I, I really think that the uh, Human Rights Legal Support Center has really done a tremendous job of setting up a structure where students can thrive. Um, and you know, I see some of the members of the, the management team here, Charmaine Hall and, and, and Toby in, in the back, um, in, in robes, by the way. Um, I'm sure he's litigating an, an important case. Um, but they've really set up an environment um, where you know, the students can come in um, and after uh, some of the skills training, which takes place um, typically over the summer, you're able to hit the ground running and, and you're, you're placed right at the front line of legal services in Ontario. Um, as, as, as we get into practice, we hear that term more often. You know, you're, you're at the front lines, right? So you, you imagine um, a, a battalion of soldiers ready, ready to, 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 to fight a war. Um, and, and in many cases, that, that is the, um, the mindset of, of, of the team at the HRLSC. Um, no guns, <laughs> no, no, no weapons, um, but, but the commitment to addressing the pressing human rights issues across the province um, you know, strikes, strikes at each of our, our, our hearts. Um, and so one of the things that I found most rewarding about the ADIP program is its ability to give students the opportunity to learn the language of human rights. Right? Um, so you, and, and you'll learn that language primarily um, by assisting on the intake line, um, which uh, can be grueling at times. Um, it was mentioned earlier this morning that the center receives uh, 25,000 calls per year, 20, or you know, sometimes it, you know, it's 20, sometimes it's 24. Um, but that equates to you know, potentially you know, hundreds of calls per day. Um, and in fielding those calls, the center's dedicated staff, along with ADIP students, um, are literally at that front line. And they literally have to understand the concerns of persons across the province and translate that into the language of, of human rights. And so students have an opportunity to learn this language of human rights in relation to the most pressing issues of, of the day. Uh, so most recently, of course, uh, concerns related to COVID-19. Um, you know, ongoing concerns about uh, racial discrimination and anti-black racism um, in various settings, right? In, in relation to policing, education, and, and services. Uh, concerns with respect to sexual harassment. Um, one of the um, memories that stands out in my mind from my time with ADIP um, was seeing how these social movements intersect with you know, the very issues that we were, we were teaching and, and providing services on. Um, so during my time with the program, um, we saw the uprise of, of, the, of the BLM, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so literally, I remember one morning uh, coming into work and there was a, a BLM protest um, at Young and Dundas and, you know, walking uh, a few, you know, meters to the HRLSC office uh, to continue my work on a file regarding racial discrimination. Uh, similarly, uh, while, you know, working with the ADIP program and the students, um, there was important cases regarding sexual harassment. Um, you know, the, the Gomeshi trial was, was happening, uh, me, again, meters from the HRLSC office. Um, and we, now, we know the HRLSC also administers the, the SHARE uh, program, which grapples with the same issue. Um, and so s seeing that intersection um, and, and, and working with students is, is certainly an in invaluable experience. Um, the program often boasts that it has, it offers a one-to-one -one mentorship program. Um, and I, I almost want to say that's a lie. <laughs> I, I say that, that it's a lie because everyone at the center um, takes students under their wings, right? So um, if, if and, 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 we're, and we're not selfish. <laughs> if we don't view ourselves as a selfish one. So if, you know, you have a student who has a particular interest in 
uh, perhaps sexual harassment, or if you're you know, a student who has a particular interest um, in, in, in racial discrimination, and your lawyer mentee doesn't have any files in that area in that particular term, um, there's usually no hesitation to um, facilitating that experience through another um, lawyer at, at the office. Um, the other reason why I think the one-to-one -one mentorship is a lie is because students have an opportunity to participate at legal team meetings. And those legal team meetings are really an expert panel um, where students have an opportunity uh, to learn the nuts and bolts of human rights practice and the law. Uh, but more importantly, it's an opportunity for them to understand how, al how resources are allocated um, within a legal setting. Um, and sometimes, you know, the allocation of resources, given the pressing demands that the center has, um, is, is a skill that will carry through your entire career, and it is a skill that um, you get to learn with, with, with a bunch of, of, of experts. Um, in terms of you know, benefits to the center, I, I think that really the learning is, is reciprocal. Um, somebody mentioned earlier in the program uh, that you know, lawyers are all about the case law, um, which is true, uh, but at, at the center you learn that litigating cases is really um, all about the facts. In, in many cases. And the interpretation of the facts are often based on lived experiences. And so, you know, members of the ISOC team who have, you know, lived experience and, and, and expertise in, on Indigenous services certainly taught me and, and students benefit similarly. Um, at the same time, students' lived experiences, students come into the HRLSC with um, an amazing. Um, a, a, a amount of skills and, and understanding and knowledge. I've worked with students who had backgrounds in nursing. Um, we've had students who've had background in policing. And those lived experiences can help us interpret facts in a way that are relevant to the decisions that we, that the HRLSC makes on files and to, you know, our approach to particular cases. Um, so really, um, the, the relationship is, 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 is cyclical. Um, the, the learning uh, benefits you all. Uh, the training is tremendous. And I, 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 I can't say enough good things about the AIDA program. I'll stop there and. Thanks, Roger. That's great. Anya, over to you. Great. Um, first of all, I think I need to apologize for the frog in my throat. I lost my voice <laughs> yesterday, but hoping that with the help of the microphone, I'll be able to sufficiently project. Um, so it was such a privilege and delight to be asked to um, come and share some of my experiences as an ADIB student and um, try to reflect and connect some of those learnings to how my career has evolved since then. Um, so I was lucky enough to be accepted into the ADIP program um, in the last year, in my last year of Osgood, um, and that was the 2013-2014 academic year, so a while ago now. Um, and just thinking back, um, during my time at Osgood, I know I was seeking out so many different um, opportunities for experiential education. Um, for instance, in my first summer, um, I spent my first summer after uh, uh, working in a legal aid clinic in Cambodia. I did a lot of mooting through the International Criminal Court Trial Competition and the Jessup International Moot. Um, and then, of course, the, the ADIP program. And I was so delighted to have capped off my experience at Osgood with this program because I think it really helped me consolidate um, all of the experiences and learning from Osgood over the, the last three years and also um, equipped me with the tools and uh, confidence to embark on a career in human rights. So um, lots of folks have already spoken about the many benefits of the program for the students and I definitely agree with all of those. Um, but reflecting back 10 years later, um, it's interesting to draw the connecting line between um, some of the manner of thinking, attitudes, and practical skills that I developed during my time at ADIP and how that has helped me develop my career. Um, and while these lessons are many and varied, um, I thought I would focus on two major takeaways that I took from my time at ADIP. So the first, I think everybody has mentioned mentorship. I can't say enough about the education that I received from my mentor, Kate Seller. 
Um, she really trusted me with big new challenges. She gave me a lot of autonomy in my role, but at the same time, simultaneously created the most supportive environment for learning for me. Um, and as Roger was saying, it wasn't only Kate, but it was the entire center. Um, I started my ADIP experience uh, with my articling position already secured at Amnesty International. And knowing this, I was, um, it was really considerate of Kate to have started off our relationship together, um, asking me about my own personal learning goals and my professional development plan. And in the end, I had such a wide breadth of experience at the, at the clinic. Uh, I was interviewing clients to develop their applications. I was attending hearings. I prepared an examination in chief. I led a mediation. Um, I was also preparing briefing books and taking lots and lots of notes at <laughs> client meetings and at hearings to help develop cases. Um, all of these skills were so invaluable for my time articling at Amnesty. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I spent a lot of my year uh, advancing strategic litigation on a whole range of human rights issues from children's rights to indigenous rights to the rights of refugees and migrants um, and the rights of adequate housing and health care. Um, and this work involved working in partnership with leading constitutional and human rights lawyers from across the country. Um, and I think one of the things that I took from my work with Kate is that she really modeled for me how to work in a lawyer-student mentorship relationship. Um, and this was so helpful for me in terms of developing a quick and productive working rapport with all of the wonderful lawyers that were volunteering their time with the organizations. Um, I was able to contribute to developing substantive arguments. I was able to lead in drafting submissions. I was leading and preparing all the briefing books and even process relating points like document serving and delivering submissions to the court. Um, so I think more than anything, the, the ability to do this kind of work with the lawyers and, uh, and to confidently bring my own voice to the process was a major takeaway and invaluable part of the experience that I had at ADIP. Uh, the second major takeaway uh, was the access to justice value of intake services and understanding how to operate in high volume, high pressure environments. Um, working uh, at intake at the HRLC was grueling, <laughs> but it did convey in the most um, effective manner the tremendous breadth and scope of human rights concerns faced by Ontarians across the province um, and the enormous value of a center like this, one that provides impartial, high quality and free legal advice. Um, I think it was one thing to be able to have positive calls where you can validate callers' concerns, confirm that there is a potential claim under the code and help them through next steps. It was another thing to have more difficult conversations and deliver bad or disappointing news um, in a sensitive manner that was compassionate to the fact that people were calling after having pretty crummy experiences, even if they weren't falling under the code. Um, and doing all of this in an incredibly fast paced environment where phones were ringing all day to navigate these with efficiency was a real challenge. Um, this experience directly served me in the job I secur secured after my articling position. Um, so that was late 2015 when uh, the newly elected government uh, uh, pledged to admit 25,000 Syrian refugees to Canada before the end of the year. Um, and at this time, hundreds of thousands of Canadians uh, were mobilizing across the country to, uh, to try to sponsor refugees, many of them for the very first time. And this completely overwhelmed the, the sector who uh, would normally be in charge of uh, private sponsorship. So in this context, the Refugee Hub at the University of Ottawa collaborated with lawyers in Ottawa and in Toronto to create a new program called the Refugee Sponsorship Support Program, which in just a few months uh, uh, recruited and trained over 1,400 lawyers and law students to uh, support clients in navigating the private sponsorship process. Um, so I was brought in as the national coordinator of that initiative. Um, I did a lot of different types of work for that. Um, I developed lawyer training materials. I delivered training. Uh, I consulted um, with lawyers in drafting key legal documents. Uh, I created and administered processes for intake, um, as well as uh, for a lawyer client matching. Um, I provided follow up support to lawyers who were serving clients, and I also took on clients of my own. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that uh, during this time, I was also the central contact point for the thousands upon thousands of inquiries that were coming into our program from, uh, from refugees all over the world, desperate to find an avenue to safety to Canada, and also from Canadians who were desperate to try to 
um, access the private sponsorship program to, to bring their loved ones to safety here. Um, and while the SSP was able to help many, I think a lot of my time was spent explaining to people why, for whatever reason, their, um, their particular circumstances didn't qualify them for private sponsorship. And this was incredibly emotionally taxing, um, and the volume of the requests for support were really overwhelming. I, I just simply would not have been equipped to do that without my experience working intake at the HRLSC. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, now I'm running out of time. Um, just to say, uh, the SSP also had um, a wonderful experiential component as well. Um, we worked with wonderful students from Toronto, Ottawa, Kingston, and Windsor who were matched with lawyers uh, to, to deliver services to clients. And um, just having benefited so much from my own experiential education services, it was wonderful to be able to facilitate similar experiences for other students at a time of really critical need. Um, so my time at the HRLSC has continued to influence my career in so many ways. Um, I continue to look back at the lessons I learned and am so proud that the program continues to serve um, new generations of Osgood students to do great human rights work going forward. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Anya, for those great remarks. I'm sure, I know, I know the panel, people have questions for the panel and there's lots they want to dig into. Um, but before we do that, we're going to invite uh, Professor Baba to share a few words. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, uh, for being here today, uh, and to the organizers, especially Ina, uh, for um, the invitation uh, to, to reflect a little bit on my uh, connection to the anti-discrimination program. Um, in many ways, the origin story of the program is connected to sort of my origin story in the profession, in the, in the sense that I was uh, a, y a young lawyer um, who f uh, found myself doing my LLM at the time that Bill 107 was uh, introduced, and so I had the chance to spend a year of graduate school really reflecting on the human rights system and on access to justice. Um, I ended up uh, coming back uh, from the U.S. and getting appointed to uh, the HRTO in, in 2008 as part of a huge um, I think there was like 15 of us appointed at the same time. I somehow uh, snuck uh, through that door. Um, uh, and certainly there were people, uh, people who are in this room who took a chance on me by uh, offering me that, uh, offering a recommendation to, um, to the government to appoint me to that position, which I was far uh, underqualified for at the time. Um, and then, uh, but I learned a lot from the people I worked with there, and this interconnection of the three pillars really came to bear in my own kind of experience, because um, after leaving the uh, tribunal to join the faculty at Osgood, um, sorry, before I did that, I was teaching as an adjunct at Osgood, and it was in, during that time that I actually uh, saw an opportunity, um, and, I, and I'll take credit for making the fateful introduction that, that Sonia has described led to such great uh, results. Uh, I did nothing more than introduce two people who I liked very much and who I thought could make a wonderful thing happen, and that was Bruce Ryder and Kate Seller. I, I simply said, uh, I was teaching Bruce's course uh, at Osgood. I think he was on sabbatical, and I, I said, gosh, there's a lot of really enthusiastic students here. Uh, by evening I was doing that, and by day I was uh, adjudicating and mediating cases at the HRTO, and I was thinking, gosh, there's so much unmet demand here. If only we could align uh, the demand for uh, human rights representation with the supply of human rights energy in the student body. And it really, well, I mean, that's pr it sounds very naive uh, uh, to, to, to say that now, but that's genuinely how I felt. Um, and little did I know uh, that Bruce and Kate would uh, be able to take that uh, and really turn it into a practical program of action that within a year, uh, around the time uh, that I joined Osgood as a full-time faculty member, uh, the program was up and running. And it was, it was a thrill uh, to be able to draw from my uh, then expired experience at the HRTO uh, in my new role teaching and to, and to have a role uh, in the training from, from day one. Uh, and, and I believed in the program uh, really deeply because of its promotion of these twin goals, uh, being uh, promoting good, uh, high-quality experiential education, which, as Sonia uh, explained, was, was really in vogue at that time and was being embraced and developed uh, at, all, at all levels of legal education, uh, combined with the priority of access to justice, which was also uh, 
a, 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 pressing, a pressing need at that point had been explicitly linked uh, to the rationale behind the institutional redesign. And so uh, I was eager to see uh, the promise delivered, and I was skeptical that it could be. Uh, and I think we've, we've seen um, that skepticism was well placed, and uh, I think w we ought to ask ourselves what would the state of access to justice in Ontario be without the anti-discrimination intensive program. I think what we've seen over the last 10 years is uh, a complete interdependency that has developed between uh, Osgood in its need to provide students with meaningful access to human rights uh, training and opportunities um, and, and the center which uh, has become uh, increasingly, uh, if not ex existentially, dependent on uh, the, the labor of students um, which, which I think is a good thing. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to build partnerships that uh, create uh, import, important uh, interdependence um, and collaboration. Um, so uh, in my opinion, it was win-win by design. Uh, and I think a very good argument can be made that it has been win-win in implementation and in effect as well. Uh, we've heard uh, great uh, reflections um, on the opportunities that the program has given to students. Um, we've, we've heard some, though not a lot, on the impact that the program has had on access to justice in the province. I think we could hear more about that. I think we could also identify ways in which the program could extend itself deeper into the access to justice crisis in the province uh, and do more, and uh, while still maintaining its standards um, and increasing uh, the value uh, to students and to the center, uh, mutually reinforcing. Uh, the one thing I love about the center is that it provides a front row view of the future of human rights. Uh, and we know that this is exciting because looking back, we can see how much human rights has changed over time. Human rights today is almost unrecognizable uh, to the human rights that were adopted in, in 1962. Um, human rights today, have evolved so much in just the 10 years of the program. As has been mentioned already, we've got new grounds, we've got new cleavages, we've got new horizons. Uh, and the students uh, are at the front end of that, um, applying uh, theory to practice uh, and forging uh, new pathways forward. Um, and so uh, uh, I, would also, I would also say that um, the future is not entirely certain. And so while I, like, I, I want to highlight the exciting um, aspect of New Horizons, um, the, the challenges to the center, uh, both uh, on, on multiple levels, uh, not just legal, um, and uh, perhaps especially not legal, uh, will continue to rise. The social cleavages, political cleavages, institutional pressures, and so on, uh, the, that are uh, putting human rights themselves in question. Uh, will need to be resisted by students and, and uh, strategies for uh, reaffirming the importance of human rights in our society will be uh, the, uh, the call for them. Um, but there's, there remains a lot to be hopeful for. I note that we have uh, robust participation today from the provincial government uh, at a time when the human rights system really needs it. And I just remember, I'm thinking back to, to 2008 uh, when I was first appointed to the tribunal and there was a, a genuine question about whether uh, the uh, political, um, whether the political landscape would continue to maintain space for a robust human rights institution. And the fact that uh, we still have one with us, uh, I think uh, at least some credit uh, can be paid to the HRLSC for, for, for maintaining the legitimacy of the entire human rights system in the province. Uh, so on that um, slightly hopeful note, uh, I will end <laughs> before I say something that's not so hopeful. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Baba. Okay, before we go any further, I'm just going to check. Ina, you're going to have two questions. We do have a delicious break. Okay, and we don't want to get between the audience and their samosas and their bio break. So, okay. Um, all right, well, maybe I'll, so I have a list of questions here, but uh, the first one is one that I, I think um, it's an invitation, actually, more than a question, but I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room that would like to hear this, so it's for you, Professor Lawrence. People would like to hear your story you wanted to share oh. <laughs> about 2021. The, the story was just about the intake lines in the fall of 2021, so the students, I, of course, none of us were present at the center. Everyone was virtual. 
the students were put on intake lines and right away they were, the center had an unprecedented number of calls, um, all of which were about um, people who felt they were being discriminated against because they were not wearing masks. So this was about masks, not vaccines. And it was, this was a really interesting space for reflection, right? Because most of the students were not sympathetic to these arguments. They also knew that technically most of these people had no way of attaching the claim to any of the grounds under the code, but with very small number of um, exceptions. So just as a space for challenging ourselves to reflect on what does it mean to have this emotional response to the thing that is happening, also can we come up with the spaces where um, our negative response is not technically the right answer? Where can we see the nuances in this story? But this all obviously came rushing back when Danielle Smith made her um, breathtaking comment the other week that this group was the most, I think she was actually talking about the unvaccinated, but um, you know that this group was the most discriminated against. But I think that was a space where you're kind of pushing yourself to think about human rights, um, to think about the ways in which clearly like a significant segment of folks believed that this was something that should be protected and kind of working that through our understanding of what actually is the human rights system supposed to be protecting? How do we understand our negative responses to some of these claims? Um, how do we put those together with the doctrine? And then how do we, um, in the kind of day-to-day -day, tiny minuscule ethics of daily practice, how do you talk to people mm -hmm. that you really disagree with? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that when, in fact, this particular group of callers was noted as um, much more hostile than the usual calls. So that was a really interesting experience to watch the students walking through. And again, like they were walking through that physically on their own at home. <coughs> and so the, the, the kind of culture of support that had been built up at the center was really important for them. So yeah, it's really a story about reflection. Like technical mm -hmm. knowledge is pretty easy, right? Like you got a ground? No? No ground? Okay, no case. <laughs> But there was a lot more to that, that story, I think. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think it was a beautiful addition to the comments you've already shared because it really highlights the importance of reflection as a key piece of any kind of experiential learning program. So there's theory, there's practice, but reflection. And reflection is an essential professional skill for, for lawyers for all of the reasons you've just highlighted. So I think it was thank you to whoever asked, uh, issued the invitation, and thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm grateful to be able to get that one out. <laughs> it's really, you were going to have to hear it over samosas if you didn't get it. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to pull one out, and I apologize to those of you who um, took the time to write out questions that we're not going to have time for. Perhaps you can approach some of our panelists over the break and ask them, but I'm going to ask uh, one that, and then just invite whoever would like to on the panel to address it, so, um, and I'll try not to. Is access to justice one of the reasons to have an experiential learning program, or is it simply a benefit that flows from such programs? I mean, I, I think I've already made expressed my view, which is I think it's um, more than uh, an incidental benefit for for me anyway. Uh, it's it's part of the intention, uh, but I think that there. It's it's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing what other panelists say before I say anything more. <laughs> I, I think it's it's it's. I agree with, with with the professor. It's more than just incidental. I mean. Looking at it from the perspective of you know the service meeting its demands, you know I think the experiential learning program is is definitely beneficial, um, but also from the perspective of of mentorship and and advancing the profession. Um, I mean certainly not everyone who um, walks through the HRLSE will go on to a career in human rights, but many of them do. Many of them will. I'm 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 one of them. Um, my co-panelist is is one of them. So I think. Um, for both of those reasons, I, I think it's 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 important and, and, and more than just incidental. Any, anyone else? No. Well, what I'll say is that I I think that this is um, this is really about what is the professionalism piece of experiential learning. 
And I think that it is happening now that we have many more kinds of experiential learning opportunities sprouting up at law schools that don't necessarily have an access to justice peace. They see themselves much more as about um, technical learning of particular kinds of skills and understanding how to operate in particular kinds of professional environments. And I think that there's a way in which that's a loss because um, the profession is a self-governing profession. If that's a privilege uh, of the profession. The profession has a mandate to act in the public interest. And so I think that um, recognizing the significance of the access to justice problems writ large that we have, I, I, I actually tend to think that it should be a more critical part of the access of the experiential learning programs that we develop. I, I agree with that. I think I think law schools uh, building partnerships with other institutions. So at the institutional level, uh, I think there's a responsibility, frankly, uh, for law schools to do that to try to use their resources to uh, to to compound the capabilities of other institutions. Like Osgood does this with Parkdale Legal Clinic, and and we do it with the HRLSC. Perhaps we do it with others as well. And I agree with with Sonia that that this is something that we. Uh, ought to do more of as part of uh, public interest responsibility. We didn't talk about yeah. transferability of skills, but that would be one way to cover the objection um, to the notion that everything has to be in an access to justice mm -hmm. space, right? But because we're, we're here talking about people who remain committed to human rights, but the transferability of skills argument I think is pretty clear, as is the transferability of um, professional attitudes and uh, ethical uh, mindsets. Access to justice, is, it's, it's inherent to the work that the center and, and ADA does, right? And so it's, 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 it's a training ground for, for continuing to address these issues or at least, you know, keep it in, in the back of your mind, if, even if you wind up working at a, um, a large firm, that, you know, this is, this is very much an issue that's, that's alive and on the ground and, and, and you get that experience through the ADA program. Well, I think experiential education programs more generally, I mean, part of it is about so much of the learning is, yes, it's about the, the substantive law and the procedural law, but it's actually the, the process of confronting the disconnect between the law as it appears on paper, neutral and available to everyone, and then the reality of especially communities, vulnerable, uh, marginalized communities trying to access those protections. Those are the kinds of learnings that stay with you. And I think, Roger, you said it so well, even for those who don't go on to practice in human rights, forgive me for sounding sentimental, but they will carry a, their ADIP experience with them in their heart. They will carry the knowledge that they, that they gain, but the, also those experiences, and they will inform the way they practice law. They will take, they, I used to think of it when I was at DLS as these access to justice champions throughout the profession, whether or not it's part of their daily work or not. Anyway, I know, I know we need to wrap up, so please join me everyone in thanking these wonderful panelists for sharing their comments. another stellar moderator. Let me introduce you to Justice Andrew Pinto, who was appointed to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in 2020. Prior to his judicial appointment, Justice Pinto served as the chair of the Law Commission of Ontario, and he practiced human rights, civil litigation, employment, and labor law for 25 years. Many in the audience are familiar with his important and influential independent review of the changes to our human rights system, which I'm not sure if you guys know, involved consultations across the province. 
in, in order for him to be able to give his insights and recommendations. His final report, as we all know, the Pinto Report, properly titled, <laughs> has been a guiding textbook for us at the Human Rights Legal Support Center in holding up to the government a mirror of what the system needs to look like. Knowing him personally and professionally, there's no question that Andrew has a deep commitment to human rights, having served as the past chair of the Equity Advisory Group of the Law Society. In 2008, he received the inaugural Lawyer of the Year Award from the South Asian Bar Association, our reception sponsors. So at the end of today's event, we're having a reception with Saba. And it's, it's just so fitting to have Andrew here as our moderator with this really exciting panel of speakers. Thank you so much, Andrew. Justice Pinto for making time. <laughs> and I'm so grateful that you are here to help inspire all of us. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Ina, and thank you so much to Osgood and the HRLSC for inviting me back. I, I feel like I don't get out very much anymore, um, and, and certainly not always to my old uh, stomping grounds of human rights. I'm going to keep my introductory remarks brief because um, are because of just of time constraints, but I would, sorry, I'm just gonna grab some water here. <clears throat> I'm gonna keep my remarks brief, <clears throat> just because I encourage you to read the bios of our esteemed um, panelists. I am simply their moderator today. We'll start with Rajanand, a name very familiar to just about anyone in Canada who does human rights. Raj is a partner with Weir Falls, a senior partner there. Among many other accomplishments, Raj is, a, is the current chair of the Board of Governors of the Law Commission of Ontario. He previously served as the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Legal Commission and founding chair of the OHRLSC. He is a longtime venture of the Law Society uh, going back a few years, a uh, frequent panelist and teacher and speaker. In 2017, he was named one of Canada's 25 most influential lawyers. Moving on, once again, a name that is synonymous, I think, with human rights in Canada. Um, happy to have Michael Gottile, uh, Canada's first accessibility commissioner who's recently appointed. Michael uh, brings many years of leadership from the administrative justice sector. He is, among many other things, a uh, former chief of commission and tribunals of the Alberta Human Rights Commission, chair of the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, and executive chair <coughs> of both the Environment and Land Tribunals of Ontario and the Social Justice Tribunals of Ontario. Excuse me. To my immediate right, we have Njeri Damali Sojourner Campbell, a practitioner at Hicks Morley. Uh, happy to be again on a panel with you, Njeri. Um, Njeri is an employment, labor, and human rights lawyer at Hicks, and she also has a previous background um, as a human rights and diversity advisor at Humber College. Looking forward to hearing from you as well. Last but certainly not least, we have Kendall Yamagishi who is um, participated in the um, important uh, ADIP program about 10 years ago in 2012. And she has practiced both as a criminal defense lawyer and more recently as a labor lawyer. So I understand you are a labor lawyer with UFCW locals 175 and 633. Now my main job is to be a timekeeper, so I've going to keep, uh, I'm going to use my judicial um, uh, sort of position here to make sure you stick to the rules. And I'm giving everyone just about seven minutes so that we can do a bit of a catch up because we want to leave some time for the important questions. So I'm going to start with you, Raj, a few comments just about uh, what we're talking about today, the, the intensive experience and its relationship to human rights. Thank you. Thanks very much, <coughs> Andrew. And um, uh, Andrew omitted from um, my uh, supposed accomplishments uh, my, um, my prescient hiring ability. Um, <laughs> uh, Andrew is a former student and uh, associate of mine, which I'm happy, and I'm happy to say that, and I'm also, there's also 
overjoyed when he was recognized by being appointed to the Superior Court of Justice uh, just a few years ago now. Um, all right, um, I, we, we, uh, we have uh, only a short uh, time, each of us, and I think, uh, ho I hope later we'll be able to have some discussion. My uh, colleagues on this panel, I think, are going to talk about the significance of the uh, HRLSC and, by extension, ADIP from several perspectives. Um, I want to celebrate the work of the HRLSC and ADIP at the level of what they do to improve our profession and to advance access to justice. And uh, uh, believe me, the last question that was put to the previous panel was not planted, I understand, but I guess it's a, an appropriate segue. I was just worried that they would actually cover what I was going to be covering. Um, I, I want to speak about this from the, from, uh, the perspective of uh, many vantage points that I've occupied with the three pillars of the human rights system, but also the law society and a fairly large firm where I practice um, and put the ADEPT's involvement and the center's involvement in that context. Um, in 2008, when the center was just set up um, to reside at the intersection of human rights and access to justice, um, I had just been elected a bencher for the first time. And I say that only because at the Law Society, for the next several years, there were many initiatives related to experiential education and the role of law schools in equipping entry-level lawyers with the skills and knowledge that they need to serve the public. There, we had a licensing and accreditation task force which looked at the educational requirements. It was controversial amongst some academics in the sense that the Law Society essentially mandated that certain competencies would be taught at law schools. Um, and we had an articling task force um, which looked at the future of articling and there was always one recurring issue, whether in the interests of uh, access to the profession, which of course articling uh, is a part of, uh, articling should be abolished and we should move to an American style, style system. I think there was a similar debate in terms of paralegal licensing. And so the issue uh, boiled down to whether experiential learning should be mandatory. And I can tell you that we heard loud and clear from the profession and from a large majority of ventures about the importance of experiential education in general and articling in particular. It was understood, I think, that the practical side of legal education was very important in the interests of the public, in the interests of the firms, the self-interest of the firms, if you like, the interests of the profession and its ethical standards, and in the interests of access to justice. Um, and so, um, uh, meanwhile, while we were uh, essentially preserving articling, um, several law schools were uh, already in the forefront of advancing experiential education and the, and the first, I think, was Osgood, going back to the um, opening of the Parkdale Clinic, then Windsor, Ottawa, Lakehead. Um, <coughs> and so I think there was an early recognition on the part of some law schools uh, that experiential learning was um, important. It was certainly, we certainly knew this from the beginning, that it was seen to be extremely desirable by students. Um, meanwhile, in terms of the benefits, I, I began sitting on, the law, sitting on the Law Society Tribunal, and still do, where we hear discipline cases, and disproportionately lawyers and paralegals there come from small firms where they don't get the experience of mentoring, gaining from the insights of others on a day-to-day -day basis in acculturation in the legal profession. So experiential learning, I think, was recognized by some law schools to be very important. Um, it, it is uh, equally important, particularly in the area of human rights, for several reasons. The reasons include 
the uh, serious gaps in access to justice for human rights claimants. Um, uh, even at the HRLSC, I think we realized early on uh, under Kathy Laird's leadership um, that we would have to be innovative to maximize the impact of scarce um, funding. Uh, I just wanted to say a, a few words in the time that I'm, I'm being uh, ordered, uh, <laughs> before I'm ordered to stop, um, that uh, about the uh, professional and, and professional cultural importance of uh, the center and of ADIP students who graduate from law schools. Um, the importance of a, creating a center for human rights is not only about formal complaints at the HRTO. Human rights issues arise in a variety of contexts, employment, commercial tenancies, landlord and tenant, in law firms, law firms own human rights, where practicing lawyers may not recognize that there's a human rights element. And this has also been true of the law society itself. It's a truism of human rights for practicing lawyers and it's true of the public that we don't, that the, the, the task and the challenge is not knowing what you don't know. And I can tell you that I see this firsthand in the practice of, for example, real estate, corporate litigation, and, and so on. This is a void that the alumni um, of the um, HRLSC and of ADIP have started to fill to begin a culture of human rights in the profession. It's important to recognize that human rights understanding is, goes beyond the small human rights bar and the labor lawyers. This mighty cohort at the HRLSC is serving to infuse human rights across an array of, of contexts. And so it can serve in many ways in this professional context to spread the word, to build competence in human rights in the profession, not just in boutique human rights firms, and in to promote collegial dealings between the applicant side and the respondent side and all those who are in the middle as to what needs to be done to promote equality for the organizations and the individuals that they represent. Thank you very much, Raj. Thank you. We are going to, oh. we are going to, of course, hear some more from our panelists in uh, the Q and A. We're going to go straight to Michael Gottile. Michael, you have uh, the benefit from a, sort of a cross Canada perspective, and I'm very interested in hearing about both your new position, but uh, as focused on uh, today's topic. <coughs> Right, thank you. Uh, and uh, certainly an honor to be here. I feel like I'm sort of come home and uh, amongst uh, friends and colleagues and uh, new faces as well. Uh, you know, when I was asked to speak um, on this topic, I, I, I went back and I uh, reread uh, one of my favorite books on human rights and human rights theory. It's called Human Rights as Battle Battlefield. And some of you may know it, if you don't, the, the essential theme is that we often think of human rights as, you know, a set of uh, prescriptions and protections embodied in uh, statutes like the Human Rights Code or international covenants, you know, essentially handed down from above. These are rights granted to citizens and, you know, members of the community. But the authors and a collection of essays, the editors, say, well, there's another perspective, and that actually human rights are given meaning uh, and develop, and I think uh, Faisal was uh, talking about uh, this, uh, they're actually given meaning through the actions of individuals and groups uh, who face discrimination, who face marginalization, and who are standing up and say, well, you know, I'm going to use this claim, these claims, uh, to put forward our position. In other words, that human rights actually comes from below. It, it, they are developed 
in contested, as the authors say, in contested political spaces. And I, I think there's uh, something really interesting about that. And I think we can see that. I mean, you know, we know, for example, you know, uh, Susan Brooks and her fellow employees at Canada Safeway were the ones and their supporters uh, who got the discrimination on, on the basis of pregnancy as uh, to be included under the definition of discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, you know, Del Delwyn Vreen and, and uh, Jim Egan and Jack Nesbitt and uh, Michael Leshner were all people along with others in the LGBT community uh, that, you know, fought for LGBTQ rights under to, to be recognized in um, under the charter and, and in human rights statutes. In other words, they led uh, and from those struggles uh, for equality, uh, the legislation followed. It wasn't handed down from above. And why is this important? I think because, uh, first of all, the Human Rights Legal Support Center has been there. And I, I can talk about a couple of cases in a second that I, I saw when I was in my time as chair of the Human Rights Tribunal. But uh, the Human Rights Legal Support Center is there uh, taking those cases, working with the communities, working with uh, communities of individuals and, and, and organizations who traditionally face marginalization, who haven't necessarily been included in rights, um, and, uh, or their rights haven't been recognized, or their experience hasn't been recognized uh, within jurisprudence as discrimination or as following, falling within the scope of the Human Rights uh, Code. And I think students, uh, you know, combining, you know, the, the union with the ADIP is like a marriage made in heaven in the sense that students are excited and fresh and uh, not like, you know, people like me, really cynical <laughs> <laughs> about uh, the law and, you know, as an adjudicator, maybe a little conservative about, <laughs> you know, interpreting the code. But, you know, uh, you know, adjudicators don't create the law. It's the people who come before the tribunal or the courts who put forward the arguments that are then articulated by the judges and, and the adjudicators that create the law. So I, I think, uh, let, let me just give you two examples. Um, so Mike, uh, Michael, I'm just going to give you, you've got about two minutes to do okay. so. Thanks. Uh, two examples. One uh, is uh, in a case called Yule and a related case of uh, Kaken. Uh, those were cases in which individuals with um, cognitive disabilities, severe cognitive disabilities, uh, said, we don't want to have to go to the courts to get a litigation guardian uh, appointed. We don't want to have to ask and beg the courts to exercise their parents' patri uh, jurisdiction, this paternalistic thing that we're allowed to a bring a claim before the Human Rights Tribunal. And, and the argument put forward by the Human Rights Legal Support Center was, Tribunal, you need to have, if, you, if, you, if rights are gonna be meaningful for this group of individuals and this community, you have to have the right to accept when people come forward and say, this is my representative, this is my litigation guardian, or in some cases, this is a, a, a supportive this person is my support to help make decisions. And from that case, which was, that argument was accepted, the Human Rights Tribunal had really instituted some groundbreaking uh, framework for not only litigation guardians and, and access, but actually the concept of support of decision making, that people aren't necessarily, they're not representative, or they're not counsel, their, their, their supportive decision making as a co uh, makers as a concept. The other case I'll mention just briefly is uh, a series of cases actually called brought by uh, a, an organization of psychi who identify as psychiatric survivors who brought a number of cases across the province challenging municipal zoning bylaws. And uh, so these bylaws would, would restrict where individuals who needed uh, could live if they needed supports. Um, and uh, 
as, as one of the claimants in that case said, you know, it, it restricts where we're allowed to live or, you know, how many of us can live <laughs> in a particular area. And, and people are, were restricted in where they lived purely on the basis of their disability and uh, brought challenges. And of course, the concept to that date was, well, these are zoning bylaws, that has nothing to do with human rights, but the Human Rights Legal Support Center and uh, challenged that and actually changed municipal bylaws across the province. So I, I'll end there, but you know, this is about uh, taking up cases and redefining what human rights means for the lives of individuals uh, in this province. Thank you. Perfect uh, timing. Thank you, Michael. We're going to proceed with Kendall. Kendall, you have, uh, you've been a criminal lawyer. We know that there's no human rights whatsoever issues in that. Um, so I'd like to hear your perspective. Sure. Thank you very much um, for having me. Um, and thank you for everybody who organized this. I really appreciate it. Um, first, I'll start out by saying my opinions are my own. They're not my employers. I actually, I don't even know what my employer's <laughs> stance is on what I'm about to talk about. And um, I'm going to be talking about the issue of jurisdiction. So I'll give everybody a moment to uh, collect their <laughs> excitement and, uh, so they can hear what I have to say. Um, so obviously, the Human Rights Tribunal can make a finding that there is a violation of the Human Rights Code but so can a bunch of other decision-making bodies. Um, for example, the Social Benefits Tribunal, or notably, for the purposes of what I'm gonna be talking about today, a labor arbitrator. And this has been a big issue for a long time. Um, there's this debate about where human rights issues should be heard um, and dealt with when it comes to unionized workers and uh, whether or not this is actually the exclusive jurisdiction of labor arbitrators. So back when I was a student at the Human Rights Legal Support Center in 2012, I wrote a paper kind of touching on this issue. So there's language in the Human Rights Code at section 45.1, which allows the tribunal to dismiss applications where another proceeding has what they call appropriately dealt with the substance of the application. And at the time that I wrote the paper, um, the language appropriately dealt with the substance of the application was in some cases being interpreted uh, to have a very wide meaning and uh, was being used, I would argue, very liberally as a way of dismissing the uh, workplace human rights applications that were coming from unionized workers. And this included, for example, um, cases where a labor arbitrator hadn't even made any kind of a decision or a finding whatsoever about whether or not there was a violation of the Human Rights Code, and in fact hadn't even engaged with that issue. So jump forward um, almost 10 years to 2021. I am now a labor lawyer, and a case comes before the Supreme Court and it's called Northern Regional Health Authority and Horrocks. Um, the citation is 2021 SCC 42. And I should just be clear, I, I didn't work on this case at all. I'm just here talking about it so we can get our CPD hours in. <laughs> uh, so Horrocks deals with a unionized worker who alleges that her employer has violated the Manitoba human rights legislation. Um, Ms. Horrocks was terminated by her employer because she attended work under the influence of alcohol. Um, she then discloses that she has a substance use disorder and files a grievance with the help of her union. The grievance is settled. It doesn't actually go before an arbitrator. And um, there's an agreement that she can keep her job if she abstains from alcohol and the language is at all times. So this is both while she's at work or while she's away from work. Um, she signs this agreement, and later somebody alleges that they see her intoxicated while at a grocery store, and um, a manager claims that she sounded drunk in a telephone conversation. And so she gets terminated based on that, and this never goes before a labor arbitrator. Thanks. So Ms. Horrocks then goes to the Manitoba Human Rights Board and argues that her employer discriminated against her and wins. 
The employer challenges this on uh, the grounds that the Manitoba Human Rights Board didn't have jurisdiction to make a decision about this termination because she should have dealt with it through labor arbitration. They end up at the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court interprets the Manitoba Labor Relations Act to say that the Manitoba Human Rights Board uh, shouldn't have made this decision and that they didn't have jurisdiction to make this decision. I would argue that this is a really scary decision for unionized workers and it arguably cuts some unionized workers out of the human rights system altogether, uh, even if it might be inadvertent. In theory, it's not a big deal. Um, since arbitrators are allowed to make findings that there was a violation of the human rights code, unionized workers theoretically shouldn't be losing out on anything. The arbitrators should be able to address violations of the collective agreement and of the human rights code, um, while human rights tribunals can only make decisions about the violations of the code and not the collective agreement. But what about somebody like Ms. Horrocks? She never even made it before an arbitrator. She's not somebody who lost before a labor arbitrator and now wants to go and try her luck at the tribunal. Um, I'd also ask what happens to somebody who is part of a union um, and then that union then decertifies, where does that person go? And there's another problem that I found in my research in 2012 when I wrote my paper on this, uh, on the similar subject. And in 2012, I found that the Human Rights Tribunal was more likely to make orders for public interest remedies and tended to award higher human rights damages than arbitrators when there was a violation of the Human Rights Code, um, which I admittedly, I don't have updated research. I haven't done a full study of every case since then in 2022. Um, but my assumption based on purely anecdotal observation is that this may still be the case. And uh, it's certainly something that concerns me and I think should concern unionized workers in the province. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Kendall. Okay. And Jerry, yes. I don't represent anyone, so I might have a chance to be here, but you represent respondents. How do you feel about that? And <laughs> I'm just putting her on the hot seat because I know she's prepared to answer this. Well, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my father is going to turn 83 in a couple of days, and uh, so uh, I want to talk. Yeah, go, Dad. <laughs> Thanks for making me. Um, so he he taught me to draw lines. That was one of the first things he taught me to do as a kid. He would always say, "This is this is what I want, and this is what you're doing, and we need to draw a line between the two." Uh, and he would always draw draw lines. And so today I'm going to be drawing lines in in, in honor of my dad. Uh, so as as a student, I remember arguing with Bruce Ryder after and as we do, after an ADIP seminar about the emancipatory potential of the code. And at the time, I took the view that while the code was a powerful legal instrument, its structure fell short of its intended purpose, which was to protect Ontarians from the harms of oppression. Bruce warned me, as he does, not to arrive too hastily at a conclusion about the code, but to read it, explore the breadth of case law, and then test, my, test its expansiveness. And so I did. And over a decade later, I can draw a straight line from that conversation with Bruce and others to the legal advice that I provide today and to my practice on behalf of respondents. <laughs> um, having, now, <laughs> having now completed seven years of legal practice and in my eighth, uh, I've advised or trained uh, over, if, as an example, over 5,000 senior leaders uh, in education, so superintendents, associate directors, directors of education, and trustees across the province uh, on their obligations under the Ontario Human Rights Code and, uh, its inter and those obligations intersection with the Education Act. Uh, and I get to help clients expand their understanding of their obligations under the code beyond the words in their policies uh, in order to leverage the mechanisms of the code that require them to co-create an education system free from discrimination and harassment and to create one that proactively works to redress systemic issues like historical disadvantage and the provision of accommodations, the equitable exercise of their discretion to discipline students, and the responses uh, to advocacy groups. 
I adopt a similar approach when I can when defending such clients against allegations of discrimination and in particular when advising them on whether settlement is appropriate. I can also draw a straight line between my work on the intake lines and the work that I do today, in particular uh, talking to clients and helping them sort of understand the story behind the claims that they might receive, especially when those, those claims are articulated in ways that are discourteous or perhaps on social media uh, or, or just hard to, hard to parse. Uh, and I, I will be honest, I didn't love intake at first at the Human Rights Legal Support Center. I'd worked in a lot of call centers prior to law school, and at first it seemed like that's what I was supposed to do. And so my, my first instinct was, I don't want to do this. Um, in addition to that, the calls were emotionally challenging because a majority of them were made by individuals whose lives were seriously impacted by discrimination and harassment. And they saw the Human Rights Legal Support Center as a lifeline and, and by extension me, which was scary because I was a student. Um, and as much as it was affirming to provide summary legal advice that oriented a person towards a solution to their problem, it was very difficult to have to explain to a person in a moment of vulnerability that their matter might not be covered by the code, especially in circumstances where there might not be anywhere else to refer them. Thankfully, I didn't have to deal with the masking issue, but I think that would have been fun. Um, and so when, when you, you might know uh, that during our year, uh, Nicole Davidson, Nick DeCastri, and my Osgood Bet, bust, bet, busty, Betty, bestie, oh boy, <laughs> Keisha Monroe nominated the Human Rights Legal Support Center for an award of excellence from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. We calculated that each student who participated in ADIP during the summer and during the term likely answered about 1,200 intake calls from the public. And so that meant that, and it means now that when an employer client uh, tells me that one of their employees or a service provider tells me that one of their service users has not been provided with accommodation or that they've experienced discrimination, I can actually draw from those calls. I can draw from the stories that were shared. I can draw from the hopefully correct uh, legal advice that I provided and the, the conversations that we had in our team to be able to explain to a client that these aren't just, these aren't just words, these aren't just a complaint, they actually trigger legal obligations that the employer or the service provider has to, has to take seriously. Right now, in my practice, I'm getting some really wonky issues across my desk. I'm seeing more clients dealing with claims of reverse racism, thank you. Um, I'm seeing equitable hiring programs uh, called anti-white racism. I mean, you can't make this up. And and these these employer clients and service service provider clients are calling. They they call our firm. That's what they they do. They call respondents uh, side counsel, and they say, "Is this a real thing? Right? Do I? I've never heard of this particular term. Is reverse? Is there a duty to accommodate? You know, reverse discrimination, which is an actual question that I get. And I get to sit down and have a long conversation. Uh, with a client, and, and I get to say no, it's, it's actually not. And I get to talk about the Ontario Human Rights Code, what its purpose is, what its structure is, what it allows employers and service providers to do, and what it prevents them from doing as well, and I, I really appreciate that. The context that I got, the, the experience and education that I got uh, from ADEP working on intake lines help, helps me to not lose sight of the people who are at the center of the work that we do and to be creative and generative in advising clients on how to learn from the remedial options that applicants are seeking. I don't believe that people file human rights applications for fun. I don't believe in the concept of frequent flyers. I don't believe that people want to tell their stories and be exposed to tribunals and exposed to a legal process and, and that they're doing it to be vexatious. I don't believe that. And so if I ever uh, come across clients who believe that, I have the opportunity to draw from my experiences at the center to say, no, actually, this is somebody who's taking a risk. And that should be respected, regardless of whether or not you agree with their legal position. So I guess, I mean, you already poked me on this, but I was prepared to talk about representing respondents in my legal practice and why, why I enjoy it. I like being the first call uh, for, from a client um, I think that if we roll back the clock 10 years and I was sitting in this audience, I put, probably would have listened to me with a, you know, a heavy side eye. But I can say, I can say that um, one of the things that I learned at ADEP, ADEP is that the work needs to happen everywhere. And that 
one of the most amazing and inspiring experiences that I have in my practice is when I'm on one side of the file and an ADIP al alum is on the other. In addition to be able to being able to kiki whenever we have you know moments of pause, I know that I'm speaking to somebody who has sound legal education, somebody who understands and respects the Ontario Human Rights Code, somebody who has developed the diligence of practice that the lawyers at the center have developed, and somebody that I can work with collaboratively and creatively to get to a solution. And I'm really proud of that, and I continue to be proud of the work uh, at Ada. That's great. All right, so I have a few questions that I think may have been generated by our audience. And just because of time constraints, I'm gonna direct uh, maybe Kendall, if you can focus on this one, and if we have time, certainly any other members of the panel. But the question is, can uh, the panel speak to experiential learning programs and its role in developing practical readiness for the real world law environment? Sure. So um, when I was a criminal defense lawyer, um, the nature of my job was that I would basically go into cells at 8.30 every morning and just talk to people who had just been arrested. I knew nothing about them. I, I didn't know what language they were going to speak. I didn't know what if they were charged with a theft under or murder. I had no idea. And that's exactly the same thing that happens when you answer the phone at the Human Rights Legal Support Center. You have no idea who's on the line. You don't have a document in front of you that briefs you of like, here are the legal issues that you want to address with this person. You just have no idea. And the really special thing about the Human Rights Legal Support Center and the ADIP program was that when this was happening, it wasn't just like, okay, you're on the phone, go for it, do your thing. Um, when we'd have these phone calls, there were a lot of opportunities for debriefs. There are a lot of opportunities to talk about what was that experience like? What was that conversation like? What would you have done differently? What did you think about it? And have this really healthy back and forth to talk about what you just did. And so that when I was going to cells at Old City Hall and sitting with this person who I'd never met before, who has been sleep deprived because they've been mm -hmm. sitting at some division for the last six hours and haven't eaten, um, it was like a reflex. Like I didn't have to sort of say, okay, uh, what's this person's name gonna be? Do they speak English? Um, what, are, what are like the main issues that are gonna be facing them? If they get out, where do they go? Because I just had this um, sort of developed muscle memory about how to deal with those situations on the fly. Mm -hmm. And that, there, that muscle memory was something that I developed with a mentor and with mentors who showed me how to develop that properly, and I think that experience is so invaluable, and it's um, something that is applicable to any kind of front lines legal work, regardless if it was in criminal law or human rights. It's great, I, like, I love that expression, muscle memory, and I think when we approach our professional work, we, we have to operate so fast, I think it's useful to have that. Did any, anybody else on the panel want to weigh in on the specific question was, just the relationship between experiential learning and uh, the practical, real-world law environment. Anyone else? Just briefly. Did you? I do. Okay. I, do, I wasn't sure if you were Go okay. ahead. So um, one of the things that I, that I really enjoyed doing as a part of the ADA program and that I still enjoy doing in my practice is practicing the strategy of scaling um, where you take what might be an individual claim and then you scale it up to its institutional, societal, or global level and examine it from that perspective. Or you might take a systemic claim or, or complaint and scale it down and see what the individual impl implications of that might be. And that happened a lot when we were analyzing cases uh, at, the, at the center and talking about them when I was thinking about legal strategy. Uh, and, and I do that in my practice now. And I think having the opportunity at an early stage um, in, your, in your legal practice and in, in law school to, to, to see the dimension of human rights issues is really valuable. And I unfortunately see a lot of circumstances now where, where that's not done. And so important, important institutional and systemic issues don't get addressed because we treat sometimes complaints as though they're just, you know, uh, you know in, in individual concerns between two individuals or more when actually they might have larger repercussions that can be addressed creatively in the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, one of the questions I think I have for our other two panelists is to maybe look uh, a little bit more broadly and to some extent into the future. Uh, the question is, experiential clinical education has been around for a very long time and much has changed, but what does the actual future look like for clinical experiential programs? Maybe I'll start with you, Raj. I think it's only um, it, it's it's only natural that it's going to expand. Uh, I mean, this is a uh, it, it's a kind of a par obviously a partnership between the bar and the law schools. I think um, as it pertains to experiential education at law school, but the trend has certainly been in terms of increases. And I can tell you again, borrowing from my time at the Law Society, that there was uh, a, a lot of consideration of whether the experiential programs at law schools, I think Osgood has 13 or something like that now. 17, 17. sorry, I'm, I'm out of date. I, I've, I haven't been a venture for since 2019. Um, that, that it's, they're likely to increase and indeed there was a serious talk about them substituting for articling or at least substituting for a uh, an abridgment of articling, and there is some, there are some provisions to that effect that were that were that were put in place. And I'll just say this: that I mean, the students want it uh, from the standpoint of ethics and professionalism and competence. It's important, particularly when more than half of the bar in Ontario is what we called at the Law Society souls and smalls, in which they don't have generally that kind of mentorship and and assistance, and so to come back to, to the, the, uh, the discussion that we had just a moment ago, uh, they, don't, they, they see all sorts of things across the, the spectrum, they have to react to them, and this kind of uh, background, this kind of muscle memory, I think is, uh, is really important. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Michael, the, so the question was, what does the future look like for clinical experiential programs, and if you can work the metaverse into your answer, that would be helpful too. <laughs> well, just put on your VR headsets and um, I, I'd say two quick things. First of all, I, I think, I, I don't know if this would work, but I think it'd be really interesting to see if there could be partnerships with, with non-legal organizations. So, you know, uh, and I know what of Osgood um, and, and, uh, and elsewhere, there's a lot of talk about community legal help, uh, paralegals, but, not, but also just community organizations that are on the ground helping people, helping to direct people, not necessarily legal advice. I, I wonder whether that would be an interesting experience um, for uh, students to work at a refugee center, a, you know, a settlement center. Um, now, maybe you need a lawyer there to make it sort of legal training, but I, I think that getting a more diverse uh, experience in the community might be quite interesting. The other thing I would say, and I'll speak for my current role, uh, I hope that these programs do consider the difficulty that students with disabilities sometimes face or feel uh, in terms of um, uh, choosing an experiential program. Um, you know, I know universities are great in terms of accessibility and that sort of thing, but I do know, and I've just read a study recently, uh, somebody I know did a study on co-op programs in university that students with disabilities select out. They just don't think they're gonna be able to, no one will take them, right? They, they, they just won't be able to, uh, you know, find a placement or, it'll be a problem. So I think that's something that uh, maybe you already think about it, but I think uh, has to be considered. Thank you very much, Michael. I think we're out of time, so I just want to thank our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much.